again, what a privilege and a blessing it is to be able to assemble those who lack precious faith and to offer up praise and worship to our most deserving Heavenly Father. Appreciate the presence of each one and those, especially who are busy, we count you as our honored guest. Something that is becoming more and more prevalent in our time is what's been referred to as the cancel, cancel culture to censor and to silence. This is the age that we unfortunately, sadly, are currently living in. That if an individual, a politician, a group, a company doesn't like what you say, doesn't like what you do, then they believe you ought to be canceled, you ought to be silent, you need to be censored. And Perhaps what really has stood out recently is when Big Tech did that to the outgoing president of the United States to, in essence, try to silence him on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Snapchat and everything else, I suppose. And regardless of what we may think of that, we see that in other aspects, not just the President of the United States, but in other realms and other circles, those who uh, do not like what somebody's position is, what they say, what they do, they are putting forth great effort to silence them, to get them censored, to get them removed. As we said this morning, there's nothing new when we come to the Bible, when we come to the Scripture. We see this in the book of Acts when Jesus has sent out his apostles to preach the gospel beginning in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In Acts chapter 4, for example, when Peter and John are apprehended, they're arrested, the Jewish rulers, they called them, Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. There in Acts chapter 4, remember how they responded uh, to that command, verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. And by the end of the chapter, we read how they spoke the word of God with boldness, verse 31. Acts chapter 5, all the apostles this time are arrested by the Jewish rulers and questioned again and rebuked in verse 28, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Again, they want to silence the apostles from preaching the gospel of Christ. Silence them from preaching that Jesus of Nazareth is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and salvation is in him. He is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy in that regard. And he has established the spirit of the kingdom. They don't want that. In fact, they go so far this time and they beat the apostles with many stripes. And again, they command them in verse 40 not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus and they let them go. How did the apostles respond? When they're told to be silent. When they want when the rulers of the Jews want to censor them and cancel them, so to speak. Verse 42 of Acts 5, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. In the book of Esther, we noted when the Jewish people were facing the prospect of being annihilated because of the plot of wicked, king, uh, wicked, wicked man named Haman. And the decree had been signed by the king, the Hasherus, that they be wiped out, they be annihilated on a certain day. Mordecai pleaded with his younger cousin, who he had raised as a daughter, Esther, who happened to be queen and wife of the Hasherus, to speak up, not to remain silent. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all other Jews for if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. 
And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Well, we're taking that statement of Mordecai this morning and continuing this evening. If you keep silent. There are times when we need to, in fact, the Bible emphasizes that quite a bit in the book of Proverbs, that the fool is known by the multitude of his words. And so there's many admonitions in both the Old and New Testament that we, we have to be careful about not speaking too much, talking too much. But that's not the context of our study today. It's those times when we must not remain silent, when we must have the courage to speak up and to take action. And so Solomon said there is a time to keep silence, but he also said there's a time to speak. And that is our focus, those times when we need to speak and not allow those who would like to silence those of us who believe in God, believe that the Bible is inspired, that it's authoritative for our life, and the truth and morality that is presented here in Scripture, that we will not be silent. We must not be silent. But if you keep silent, as we spoke of this morning, then others will not know that we are followers of Jesus Christ. They will not know that we are Christians. If we are not saying anything about that, we're not sharing that with others. If we're not letting our light shine, if we're trying to be like Joseph of Arimathea and be a, a believer in Jesus, but a, a secret disciple in the workplace, a secret Christian in, in school, not to ask to draw attention to ourselves and the kind of reaction we know we'll get from our peers if, if they knew what we really believe. No, we need to be like Joseph of Arimathea was after Jesus is dead and come out in the open with courage and boldness. If you keep silent, as we noted this morning, souls will be lost because the gospel will not be taught. We're to preach the gospel to every creature. We're not to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to salvation. And so we must pray for boldness, as Paul spoke of in Ephesians 6, not be afraid, but speak and not be silent, as even the Lord told Paul in Corinth. So souls will be saved. And thirdly, as we review just briefly from these mor this morning's points, if you keep silent, the truth will not be defended. It will not be maintained. We find examples with Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15 and Paul in Galatians 2, where some things that were erroneous, that were wrong, were being taught. And something that had to be said, truth had to be defended. And Paul says, we did not, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with them. So we have to fight the good fight of faith. We can't be, be silent when the truth has to be defended. We have to rise up. We have to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We have to teach and preach the word in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Furthermore, as we continue this evening with three additional points, if you keep silent, then error will not be exposed. Very closely connected to the previous point that the truth would not be defended. But notice with me in the book of Romans in chapter 16, please. Romans 16. Paul says in verse 17, beginning, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. Notice, contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul says to the saints in Rome, when there are those in the church who are causing divisions and offenses, notice, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, which would be what? The doctrine of Christ, which we must abide in to have fellowship with the Father and Son, 2 John 9 through 11, that we cannot simply remain silent and do nothing. 
Error cannot be ignored and it cannot be tolerated. Those who would teach error, notice Paul says they must be noted or marked and they must be avoided. No fellowship. We're not the troublemakers. They are. If they're the ones who are causing the division and the offenses, which literally means being a stumbling block to others because they are not content with remaining faithful to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And that's something that at times, brethren, through the centuries to present day in certain places have struggled with to have the courage when there's a certain brother or certain individuals who are causing trouble, causing division because of a position they hold that doesn't align with God's word. We're not talking about opinions here. We're talking about the matters of the faith that we have to contend earnestly for. That's something we just can't we sit there and be silent about. We have to speak up. We have to take action. In fact, if you notice in verse 18, that these individuals are not keeping silent. In fact, Paul says that they use what? Smooth words and flattering speech. Are they keeping silent? Are they staying quiet? No. They're deceiving the hearts of the simple with smooth words and flattering speech. We must not keep silent. Error must be addressed. It must be exposed. The teacher, in fact, must be noted or marked and identified to blunt his influence among the Lord's people. In fact, Paul practiced, of course, what he preached. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we have a specific example of this very thing, of the error that was being taught, of the names of the teachers who were doing the teaching, and the effects of the error. In verse 16 beginning, which follows a very familiar verse, verse 15, about studying to show yourself approved of the God, or diligent to present yourself approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but, he tells Timothy, shun, turn away from profane and idle babblings, for they will increase the more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. Brethren, how can we possibly remain silent or keep silent when error is described as spreading like cancer? Now, there's a word that gets our attention, cancer. And we have family and we have close friends and our brethren that we all know of and that we pray for on a regular basis that are battling the terrible disease of cancer. And how that disease so often was it spread throughout the body. It's dead. That's the term that the Holy Spirit chose to use to describe error and how deadly it is and the effects of it. So how can we remain silent when there's something that's false and it's described this way? Also, it causes the false teachers, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who are named here by Paul, they have strayed concerning the truth. So their souls now are in jeopardy if they continue that path. Furthermore, the effects of that teaching, it says they overthrow the faith of some. Some who were abiding in the doctrine of Christ, had been walking faithfully in the ways of Christ, now have been influenced by these two men who are teaching the error that the resurrection, it's already come and gone. It's already passed. And here we are almost 2,000 years removed, and it hasn't happened come to pass yet. We know it will. You see how, how and why we can't just keep silent. It's not pleasant. It's not something that we um, are eager to engage in, those kind of conflicts or controversy. But for love for our Lord and love for the truth and fidelity to it, there are times and occasions where we're going to have to do that. Those with me in Titus, 
or just a page or two over in your New Testament. In Titus chapter 1. You kind of jump into the middle here of the what Paul says about the qualifications of those men who would be appointed as elders in the churches on the island of Crete were, were lacking that Titus was to, to take care of. And in verse 9, we begin reading, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Notice that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy blokes. Paul doesn't deny it. He says this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jew Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Again, in this context, we're not dealing with, well, he, he just has a different opinion than I do. This is not Romans 14, and we got, got again, a matter of uh, something that's indifferent to God, and, but it's a conscious matter for me, but we can still, we still need a fellowship show regard for one another. No, that's not this context. This context is similar to the Romans 16 context of there's truth and there's there's error. And one of the key important responsibilities that elders have in a local church, verse 9, is by sound doctrine to exhort. Exhort, you got to speak. You can't remain silent, shepherds. Exhort and convict those who contradict. Contradict what? The truth, the word of God. You remember, elders must watch over and shepherd the flock, watch out for our souls, protect us from error. And so they can't just sit back and, well, maybe it'll go away, maybe they'll leave. We don't want to make a bigger problem of this. Well, there's going to be a bigger problem if it's not addressed in a mature and scriptural and effective way. No, they need to be exhorted they, and they need to be convicted those who would contradict the word of God. Paul goes on to describe those who are disobedient and insubordinate there in verse 10, who have idle talk and who deceive others. And he, what does he say about them? He says their mouths must be stopped. Now you might remember the image of the woman with the tape over her mouth. I know Paul's not saying go put duct tape there. But I think in a similar way that we saw in Romans 16, 17, those who would cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn, you need to note them. You need to mark them, identify them, and then you need to avoid them. You need to, as best you can, end that influence that they have. Because their mouths are running, and people need to, brethren need to know about them. In fact, notice that some may need to be rebuked sharply so that they will be what? Souls. Again, souls are at stake here. Eternity is what's at stake. And so some occasions call for a sharp rebuke that they may be sound in the faith. Again, these are not easy things to do, but we're called upon as elders in the church, as gospel preachers, as, as Christians, to have the courage to not keep silent in such times as these. As we read in our scripture reading this evening with Brent in 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 1, the apostle John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. He's talking about those who teach and preach God's word. Whether they are of God, why, John, do we need to test the spirits? Whether they're of God, because many false prophets have gone out to the world. Many false teachers exist today. And whether it's Jesse Flowers standing in the pulpit, or Steve Greaves, or whoever, you got to test the spirit. Well, I know him. I trust Jesse. He's a good guy. Well, I appreciate that. But still, 
your responsibility and mine, I'm sitting there, is to search the scripture and make sure that what's being taught is true to the word of God. If you keep silent, wickedness will only grow worse. It will not get better. It will not simply just go away. If we try to ignore it, stick our head in the sand, that's not how it works. We noted 2 Timothy 2.17 just a moment ago, but again, how will the message of error spread like? It spreads like cancer. When there's a disease, what is the goal? To stop that disease and to remove it from the body, right? Well, in a similar way, similar way and even more seriously, because we're talking about spirit, the spiritual realm now, the physical, serious as that is, cancer in the body, how much more so in the body of Christ and within our, the hearts and minds of individuals must that be stopped. And so Paul not out of hatred, not out of being a mean, mean spirit, but out of love and concern for the souls who are already have been overthrown, their faith have been overthrown, even these men, Hymenes and Pletus, who have strayed from the truth. He certainly loved them and wanted them to repent, but he wanted to stop that influence. So he named them, he identified the error, those who taught it, what it was doing. And so it can't keep silent. It won't just go away. As Paul said, in addressing sin that was being tolerated in the church at Corinth, a brother who was guilty of sexual morality, a man had his father's wife, and Paul said this sin is not even named among the Gentiles. That's a pretty strong statement. He says, the heathens don't even do, do and participate in a sin like this, and you all are puffed up about it at the church of Corinth. You should have mourned about it. You should have taken action. But you have allowed this, this brother in this sexual morality practice to continue to be in, in your midst. He said, your glory is not good, verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven what? It leavens the whole lump. Sometimes that's used in a, in a positive sense. Leaven, the scripture. The parable of woman with leaven and speaking of this, the growth of the kingdom. But typically, normally... It's used in the negative sense as it is here, <laughs> such as sin and error. But it doesn't just, you know, stay isolated. It, it's going to expand like leaven. It's going to grow, and so it must be stopped. And so he says, you need to purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lover, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So put away from yourselves the evil person. He ends the chapter in verse. 13. We noted this morning how evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse being deceived. You know what men call evil good? And they call good evil. Isaiah 5 20. Woe to those who do that. Who put darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet, sweet for good. We must speak up for the cause of truth and righteousness. We see that all the time in our society, in our world, taking something that is evil and then calling it good. Taking something that is good and pure and holy and righteous, saying, well, that's evil. Whether that be with abortion and a woman's right, whether that be in the realm of the home and, and, and marriage and the holy union that, that God ordained and instituted from the very beginning and what's been done with that. Whether that come to gender identity, he made them male and female and now I'm not for sure. Or whatever it may be. Edmund Burke famously stated that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Or maybe in our case, also to say nothing. 
God, obviously, the Lord expects us to be those good men and good women who are going to say something, who are not going to remain silent, who are going to stand for the cause of truth and righteousness. Yes, that we're going to speak the truth in love. But we're not going to cower. And we're not just going to be silent. And we're not just going to hope it goes away. Because again, if we keep silent, don't speak up, wickedness will only grow worse. If you keep silent, then you or I will be guilty of being a coward. Jesus declared in Mark chapter 8, verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me in my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. <clears throat> what a sad and tragic thought to think of my Lord and Savior being ashamed of me. But he will be if I've lived a life where I've acted and conducted myself in such a way that suggests I'm ashamed of him and what his covenant teaches, the gospel of Christ. We too live in an adulterous and sinful generation. Paul says, among whom you shine as lights, Philippians 2, 15. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. In verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part of the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Maybe it's time that we draw our attention to the very first group of sinners that John identifies in Revelation 21 8, who will be cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. But the cowardly shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone with the second day. The cowards. Those who are fearful and they yield to fear. Those who maybe are ashamed and don't speak up. How many cowards who have obeyed the gospel? How many cowards since the first century to whenever the Lord comes again will be here with those who didn't believe? But I believe that I was a coward. Will be with those who murdered and committed sexually immoral people and were liars and, and, and the wicked of the world who, who had never dreamed of Acting like, talking like, dressing like, being like, and yet we're there with them. Because we kept silent. We were coward. If you keep silent, the world will not know that you are a Christian. The gospel will not be taught, and the souls thus will not be said. The truth will not be defended. Error will not be exposed as it needs to be. Wickedness will only grow worse. You and I will be guilty of being a coward. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Well, does this matter? The words of eternal life matter. Did we give our lives for it? Our treasures for it? I hope so. And so as the Lord said to Paul, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. The Lord would say to us, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. 
want to return as we conclude our lesson tonight to the text of Esther chapter 4. The words and exhortation and appeal that Mordecai made to Esther. Do not imagine that you and the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, liberation and rescue will arise from the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. Remember her response? You remember how she brings up that she had not been summoned before the king, her husband, for the past 30 days. Think about that. Your spouse, what happens in this case for Esther to be the king, he hasn't called for her to be in his presence for a month. I mean, right there, you can have some doubts and questions about, well, is he mad at me? And say something, do something that's irritating and upset. And now I got to go before him to implore him to seek him on behalf of my people. And I'm part of that decree of, of being wiped out because I'm a Jew. And he doesn't know it. And how is he going to take that as well? All, all the things that could be running through her mind. But then she said this to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for them. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants also will fast in the same way. And then I will go into the king, which is not in accordance with the law. And if I perish, I perish. But she would not remain silent. She would speak. And she would save her people with her courage. There's going to be occasions and circumstances that are awful daunting to us in our life that could easily cause us to cower, want to hide in the corner, and hope that everything will be okay. But those moments, we need to realize that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And that we have a God who is on our side who will not leave us nor forsake us. And that we're going to rise up with courage and unashamedly speak as the oracles of God and glorify our God. And ultimately, if I perish, I perish, but I'll be saved for all eternity. And nothing else matters than that. Tonight, perhaps there are some, there are those in the audience who have not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes courage to make that decision. But you need to understand you have the people of God here who love you, who are pulling for you. We will support you. We want only the best for you. We'll be happy and rejoice as the angels in heaven will rejoice over your obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We stand ready to assist you, but you have to make a decision about following Jesus, coming to him, being cleansed by his precious blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? You must to be saved and not to die in your sin, John 8, 24. Are you willing to repent of sin, turn from sin, and live in accordance with God's will to the best of your ability? To change your ways, change your mind, and, and thus change your way? Are you willing to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 and 10? And are you willing to submit to the command to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sin? If you do those things, your sins will be washed away by the precious blood of Jesus.
You'll be raised to walk in newness of life. The Lord will add you to his body of saved believers. Acts 2 47. You'll have the, the hope of heaven for all eternity. Continue to be faithful to him until death that you might receive the crown of life. If you've done those things, you're a child of God. Maybe you've been a child of God for years and years, but there's sin in your life. There's a leaven there that needs to be purged out, that you may be a new love. Christ is our pastor, the Passover lamb. That blood still cleanses. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins when we confess them, when we repent of them. 1 John 1 9. Dear subject, dear friend, or brother, or sister in Christ, to the gospel invitation. Let it be known as we stand, as we sing.